Welcome. This is a very exciting evening for us with our celebration of the publication of David Gilbert's memoir, Love and Struggle, for what I hope will be a very fruitful dialogue um, among generations and among activists about how to build a social justice movement sparked by David's, um, sparked by readings from David's memoir, Love and Struggle. David wrote Love and Struggle in order to spark just such a dialogue. He wrote it in response to requests from younger activists um, to engage in the lessons that both that our generations can learn from each other. And so we're going to try to model this evening on the reasons, on the purpose for which David wrote the book. And so as our panelists um, speak and read from David's writings, um, I hope that you won't just be passive consumers of that information. I want you to be thinking about the ways that it intersects and resonates with your, um, with your work, with your social justice work, with your thoughts about what needs to happen in the world. And so I want to get you started at the beginning of this conversation um, thinking that you're going to be part of it. As, we, as the evening goes on. Um, I will start by introducing you to, um, to this incredible array of panelists who represent different generations and different movements um, and, uh, and who are going to start the dialogue, the conversation about how we work together to build our, our social justice movements. The, um, the panelists, I guess I'll start with Jeff at the far end there. Jeff, our panelists, Jeff Jones, met David Gilbert in April of 1967, and they've been friends and comrades ever since. Today he works for a cleaner environment. Uh, next to Jeff is Larry White. Larry, I forgot to ask you how you want to be introduced, but Larry is a longtime comrade of David's in prison, and since his release has been a tireless worker for, tireless struggler for rights of prisoners and for ending mass incarceration and for changing the paradigm of punishment on which our prison system is based. Victoria Reyes, Victoria, um, Victorio is uh, executive director of the Social Justice Center. He's a poet. He is part of um, the hip hop band Broadcast Live, and he's an organizer with New York State Prisoner Justice Network. Um, next to Victorio, Barbara Smith, who has worked in movements for social, economic, racial, sex, and gender justice since the 1960s. Um, Laura Travison. Laura, Laura Travison is a board member of the Albany Social Justice Center and a founding member of the New York State Prisoner Justice Network. She's currently a student at SUNY Albany. Dan, Dan Lyles is a graduate student of science and technology studies at RPI and an aspiring public intellectual. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, Taina, who is not a panelist but is going to help um, it's going to help facilitate the discussion. This is Taina Asili, a cultural worker and activist, um, and also a member of New York State Prisoner Justice, a musician. Good enough? Okay. <laughs> um, I, I also want to acknowledge that, um, that in our audience are a couple of people who were very important, were very involved in the events that are described in David's memoir. Um, I, I may miss somebody, but a few people who were there for those days and part of those activities and who knew David. Um, Eleanor Stein was part, Eleanor is in the back there. Uh, Suzanne Ross was also part of that movement and that, she's in the back there too. Um, and we are very especially thrilled and honored to have with us um, Kathy Boudin, who, with David Gilbert, is 
yes, Kathy. <laughs> with, with David as the parent of a wonderful son, Chesa Boudin. Um, so those are my intros, and my first job is gonna be to give you a little bit of a personal introduction to David, and um, for that I'm gonna have to do something that I don't usually do, which is to talk a little bit about my own history in public. Um, my name is Naomi Jaffe. I also was there for many of the events that are described in the book. And um, uh, let me start by saying that David is a political prisoner. Uh, um, by a political prisoner, we mean someone who's imprisoned in connection with activities that were done in resistance to an unjust social justice, to an unjust system, an unjust social system, economic, political, and military system um, in response to some of the same injustices that we are seeing uh, the Occupy movement reacting to resisting today. And so that's part of the basis for this, for what we hope will be this dialogue. Um, in David's case, uh, he was part of an action um, by a black militant organ, he was an ally, white ally in an action by a black militant organization, uh, which had was conducting, had done um, some robberies to support their revolu revolutionary and clandestine organizing. And they had done, this was the Black Liberation Army. This was a branch of, off the bla Black Panthers and they had done a number of um, expropriations to support that work. It's not, um, that, that revolutionary work is not funded by the government or by foundations. Um, <laughs> uh, and they had done many of them and without harming anyone. But this one went wrong and um, a Brinks guard and two uh, police officers were killed. And as a result, um, a number of people received some long prison sentences. Uh, David was charged with um, all three of those killings, although it was never, no one ever was actually proven to have done any of those shootings. There was no evidence about who did them. Uh, David was unarmed in New York State, as David says. Um, if you have any role in a felony in which someone is killed, you are, um, you can be charged and sentenced as if you pulled the trigger. So he was, that's the 75 to life is three consecutive 25 to life sentences. Um, so I met David also in 1967 when we were both very, we were both fiery young students organizing in New York City, organizing, we, we co-founded um, New School SDS together. We had um, a very intense and passionate romantic relationship, but, but fairly short actually. And <laughs> Shorter than you would think from David's description in the book. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, after, and after David broke my heart, I pulled myself together and went on to, um, to participate in many of the same organizing activities, um, first with SDS and then with the Weather Underground that David did. Um, but also to be very involved in the early days of what we then called the Women's Liberation Movement. Um, and that helped me to move from heartbreak to healthy anger. And as a result, <laughs> although we were in the same circles, we didn't have all that much to say to each other for the next 10 years. <laughs> so when David was, so as a result, when David, when the, um, when the Weather Underground fell apart in 78, 79, um, I moved to the Midwest with my partner, with my then, uh, then and current life partner. And so when um, the Brinks action happened and David was arrested in 1981, I read about it in the paper like everyone else. And um, I was pretty shocked, but I wasn't in the state and so I didn't really have any relationship to it. And over the next three years, it was very, it was huge news all over the country, this robbery and arrest. And over the next three years when the trial and sentencing all developed, um, and that during that time I was um, having a baby, moving back to New York State, getting myself 
set up in a, in a post-underground life, figuring out what to do with my life. And so I didn't really think about it very much. I didn't have a whole lot to do with it. Um, and I was not in touch with David, um, and f not for quite several years until I ran into Jeff one day, and he said, um, David's asked about you, and um, you could write to him if you wanted to. And as a result, I was forced to confront my level of massive denial and distancing about how very, very closely this could have been me and about how terrifying it was to have one of my closest friends and lifetime comrades sentenced to life in prison and how frightened I had been to think that this had anything to do with me at all. And as a result, I managed to pull myself together and pick up a pen and write the first letter to David. That was in um, 1988. And the moral of this story, actually, is that I wanted to read you some excerpts from David's first letter back to me. We had not spoken in 10 years, more than 10 years, maybe 12 years at that point. And I think that letter gives you a little bit of personal insight into who David is, because he's trying to explain to me after all this time who he is. February 5th, 1988. Wow, it is wonderful to hear from you. Needless to say, I've thought about you many times over the years. Then Jeff ran into you, and I got a little secondhand glimpse as he told me that you were in good spirits and doing very positive political work. And then David does, I'm not going to read you all of it, but then David does what he does in every single letter to me and to everyone else, which is to engage with what I said to him in my letter to respond to it, to talk about it, to be interested in it, to be supportive of it. And he goes on for quite a ways doing that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip that part. Well, even though I've thought a lot about this letter for the four hours since I got yours, I just got stopped. Not a problem of having something to say, just a problem of my thoughts and feelings running off in many different directions. As you say, our relationship and the relationships of those times have a permanent place in what we've all become. So much has happened, we've moved on in so many ways. It's not that there's a pressing need to unravel those past relationships in order to be whole today, but I definitely miss the connection and continuity of friendships, especially when there are still many shared values. There's another aspect that has particular intensity for me in prison. Missing intimacy and sexual sharing as I do, I spend a lot of time thinking about reviewing past lover relationships, partly savoring what was enjoyed and shared, partly self-critical for ways that I was hurtful, and at the same time failed to appreciate the other person fully. Maybe I spend too much time on this second aspect. Maybe in addition to appropriate self-criticism, there is a component of male ego about not having done better in certain ways. But in any case, I think about you and our relationship a lot. I savor what I learned and gained from you and kick myself for what could, I guess, be called our immaturity. But I'd prefer to say the distance we yet had to go from the society that shaped us, and for me in particular, from male supremacy. But I'm very thankful for the love we shared and particularly happy that you are doing so well now. You asked if I'm anyone you would recognize. My reflexive response was that I'm basically the same old person. But then I had to laugh because the particular vignettes of me you recalled are quite unlike me today. I don't really express that much exuberance and passion. Not the past two years, anyways. And my sense of humor has dulled, too. So I guess prison has taken more of a toll than I'd like to admit. Well, not just prison, but the combination of prison and of trying to come to grips with some of our weaknesses and of the current state of the movement. But in being honest in this way, I don't want to paint an overly bleak picture. There is a struggle against discouragement and cynicism, but I haven't lost my core values, my identification with the oppressed, my desire to be part of fighting for a more humane world. 
I feel like there is a lot to be learned and gained from the experience I'm living through. It is a long-term struggle on whether the where or the lessons will predominate and probably depends on historical factors much larger than my will and spirit, although these must play their role. While there are many joys of life that I miss, particularly being with Chesa and with Kathy, but also a host of other things, I really consider myself very fortunate in many ways. I have a lot of love in my life, a lot more than many people are allotted in this society. Chesa has been incredible in how he has stuck by me and Kathy despite the pain for him. And Kathy and I have been able to maintain a strong relationship despite the separation. I have a number of friends, as well as my folks, who've really stuck by me and have even forged some very gratifying new relationships since I've been in prison. The main problem for me, analogous to the difficulties for friends in the street, is to find a way to be productive, to contribute to social change. Please don't hesitate to write me about joys you experience that might not be available to me. Rather than feel jealous or pine about them, I get enjoyment from loved ones' enjoyment of such things, and it helps keep me in touch with those aspects of life. As it happens, the particular joy that occasioned your question, the view from your house, is one I can share more directly. The one benefit of the move to Clinton is that I now have a nice view of the Adirondacks from the prison yard.